Well, good evening, folks, and welcome to our lockdown Aaron tasting. Everybody's very excited about this one. We have um, sold all our 150 kits, so there is uh, 150 people hopefully sitting, waiting with bated breath for this uh, upcoming tasting. Um, this is the second of the tastings pre-Christmas. Last week we had a rum tasting. This week's obviously Aaron. Next week, ironically, would have been the festival and we're not doing a tasting. Following week is the gin tasting. And lastly, on the 11th of December, is the Angus and Dee tasting with uh, Glen Cadam whiskies um, from Tom and Till. So we've got quite a busy four weeks ahead of us. Um, there is still some kits available for the gin and the Angus and Dee ones. Um, they are made up, ready to go. Some people don't appreciate the fact that we've already made them up. Um, so they're perhaps wait until after this tasting before they order them. So you can order your kits online um, as normal, as well as um, the whiskies that we're doing. So we've got some nice raffle prizes at the end. So after the tasting, when Lucy's finished uh, the official tasting, obviously stay online. Um, we have some cracking um, raffle prizes at the end. So um, if everybody's ready to go, and I'm sure you are, if we can bring Lucy onto the screen, who will be our host for the evening. Hi, Hello Brian. and good evening. Good evening. Pleasure to be here. I was going to, I was going to say welcome to Dumfries, but actually you're not just in Dumfries, you're... They're all over the UK. I know. Uh, we have sent yeah, we sent kits up north. We've sent the tasting kits down south. Um, so you're all over the place this evening. So very nice to, to see you. What we didn't um, tell you before was that the Dram Busters used to go um, annually to the Aran Festival oh, every fantastic. year. We did it for four months. Oh, it was, a, it was a great day out. We used to leave Dumfries about um, 8 o'clock in the morning, and we never got back till 8 o'clock at night because of the ferries and things. I say, yeah, so, ferries running. Uh, but, no, it was very good. And I, we stopped after about four or five years, and ironically, the year that we were going to start again is uh, this year when lockdown started. So I'm sure once things get back together, um, there'll be a few dram busters hitting the island at your next and festival perfect. when it's so. Um, I'll leave it to you for the first hour for the first four whiskies. And if anybody's got any questions, please do feel free to ask Lucy and she'll give you the questions. So, um, welcome to dram busters. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I'm very looking forward to. Uh, the tasting this evening and actually being a regional sales manager for um, Isle of Iron Distillers, I usually cover sort of the European and Latin American markets. So I don't often get to do a tasting on, on home soil. So it's uh, really nice to be able to do that just now. Good. Right. So the evening's all yours. <laughs> thank you very much, Bren. Well, Fab, I, um, Karen, can you help me share my screen and we'll kick off the tasting. Wonderful. Hopefully you guys can all see that. So again, for um, for those who, who don't know me, my name is Lucy Coomber and I um, am a regional, regional sales manager at Isle of Arran Distillers. Uh, thank you very much for joining us this Friday evening. What better way to raise the spirits, literally and figuratively, than uh, a whiskey tasting on a Friday night, especially uh, in the current uh, global climate. So without further ado, I'm not going to keep you from your whiskey. Um, we will get cracking. So I'll to start off with a bit about Aaron, our distillery. Um, and while I do so, feel free to um, start your first dram um, to get going, which is our Robert Burns Malts. And I'll come on to explaining that dram a little bit later. So our distillery, we've actually got two 
is based on the Isle of Arran. So this is the southwest uh, west coast of Scotland and it's located just you can see that little sort of pink dot there um, that's where we are based. Um, we've got two distilleries now. The first one being uh, La Carranza Distillery, which is based in the north of the island. And this was set up in 1995. And this is the distillery where um, all the, distil the whiskies you're going to try tonight um, have been made. Uh, last year, we ventured off into a, a second project, which is our second distillery, which opened up. Well, so I first started running its spirit in March last year, and that's lag just up at the south of the island, but we'll, we'll come on to that a little bit later. So this is the lovely Isle of Arran. So this is the view you get as you're coming across um, from our Drossen, um, again, on the west coast, heading across for a 40 minutes ferry journey onto the Isle of Arran. Um, I wish I could tell you that the weather looked like this all the time for the ferry crossing. Um, actually, my first ferry crossing was quite similar. Um, but it can get pretty hairy, as I'm sure a lot of you know, on the West Coast, um, which causes some disruption to some to the ferries uh, sometime. Um, and so Arran is described as Scotland in miniature. So it has up in the north, the rolling hills and mountains, quite similar to sort of highland um, like scenery. And then when you get to the south of the island, it's more sort of uh, grassy, and you get some lovely beaches down there as well. Now, Isle of Arran, um, the distillery is a, is a relatively young distillery. So we started um, distilling in 1995. So we're really classed as the starter of the new wave of young distilleries. We actually celebrate our 25th uh, birthday this year. So it's quite a major milestone for us, especially being from this range of new distilleries. And the whole idea behind uh, creating this brand new distillery at La Cranza was down to this gentleman, um, who is our founder, Harold Curry. Now, Harold Curry, um, he started, he'd um, previously worked as managing director for Chivas, so did have a whiskey background. And a few other interesting things um, just to note about Harold Curry, as well as um, his, his, his whiskey background, he actually um, started off. Um, in the army as well, he was he took part in some of the D-Day uh, D-Day landings and was part of um, Operation Desert Rats, which was actually a, a tank battle during D-Day, and um, was awarded the Légion d'Honneur, like a bravery awards, in two thousand and five for his participation. One of his other hobbies as well is he loved football. He was uh, chairman to uh, St Mirren Football Club and. Uh, one of his legacies was appointing a certain Sir Alex Ferguson and sort of encouraging him to take on uh, the manager position. So that's quite cool, a nice uh, well-rounded figure, but obviously for the sake of this tasting, the focus is his decision to uh, build uh, from scratch a new distillery on the Isle of Arran. And there are several reasons why he chose to go ahead with this. Um, so the first two I will cover with this slide here. Uh, first of all, being uh, where Aaron is situated, it was an ideal location for tourism, not too far um, from Glasgow. It's about an hour and a half to our address and then a 40 minute um, ferry journey. So not too far at all. Um, also, it was chosen for its climate, believe it or not. Um, so where you can see just, um, again, where the uh, pink, island is where, where we are. It's um, between the Ayrshire coast and also um, um, the um, Kintar Peninsula. And because of this, it's very sheltered, which is, gives us an ideal climate for maturing our whiskey. So the third reason why um, Harold Curry had chosen um, Aaron as the uh, ideal place to build a brand new distillery was because of its actual rich history in distilling. So although um, Aaron on the Kranza with a brand new distillery built in 1995, Aaron has a very rich history for distilling, but most of it is focused on illegal distilling. So in the 17 and 1800s, 
Arran was very famous for its illicit distilling and smuggling of whiskey. Um, and it wasn't until um, sort of 1826, there was the last distillery closed on the island. This is called Torrey Lynn at Lag. It was a legal distillery, one of three at that time. So there are over 50 illegal stills, but three, uh, only three legal distilleries. And this closed um, not long after the Excise Act was passed. This meant that legal distilling became easier. Um, and because of this, you had a boom of whiskey distilleries popping up all over the rest of Scotland. And at this time, being based on an island, it was more costly to produce whiskey, which meant um, that um, in 1826, the last distillery closed at Lag. But 150 years later, that's when uh, we started distilling with La Cranza and bringing distilling back to the island. So that's quite a, a nice little tie there as well for why um, uh, Harold Curry decided to bring whiskey distilling whiskey distilling back to Arran. Now the fourth reason uh, for choosing Arran as a location for a whiskey distillery is its water source. So water is the bloodline for a distillery. So there are three main ingredients that you have when coming to producing whiskey and that's barley, yeast and water and that water source is completely um, paramount in where you decide to build your distillery. So our water source is called Loch Nadabi. It lies about three kilometres from our um, distillery and it travels to us via this stream, which is called the Eason Burich. Um, so it's a very, very pure water source, very, very soft water, which means it's ideal for production. Hi, Neil. Hi from Edinburgh. Funny if that's where I am at the moment as well. Um, and so the water travels to us just down the Eastern Bjork and you can see our distillery as well, just over there. So very, very close by. And the ideal uh, reason, well, the reason why the water is ideal for our whiskey uh, distilling is it's a soft water and um, one of the purest as well um, for our whiskey production. The next thing I want to draw your attention to is actually this document here. So when it came to, act to locating the water source in La Cranza for our whiskey distilling, we obviously had to, to do a water analysis. And you can see from this document from Tatlock and Thompson, I want to just draw your attention to a few, few points here. So with soft water, what you are looking for is this bit here, hopefully it's coming up okay and you, it's readable on your screen. So this is sort of like the calcium carbonate sides of uh, the water. If it's a hard water, which some other distilleries use, like Highland Park, you'll kind of, you'll, that level of calcium carbonate will be between 40 and um, eight, sorry, 80 and 200. Soft water usually comes between 40 and 100. And considering we're 10, it shows it's a very, very soft water. Why is this important for um, a water source? Well, one of the main um, benefits of having a soft water at is it kind of leads to less calcium buildup in our machinery. So it means that we don't have to do as uh, much maintenance and we don't have to treat the water as much before using it. We actually use this water in every stage pretty much of our pr process. And um, so not having to treat it is, um, you know, saves us a lot of time and um, effort there. Another reason why uh, the source is really good for us to use from Loch Ness Abbey is the pH. So it's fairly neutral pH at 6.1. If um, the water source is slightly more acidic, this will um, sort of kill off some of the enzymes needed for converting starch to sugar um, later on in the production process. So you obviously want to, to have these uh, enzymes there. And then anything more alkaline, so 7 plus, um, the enzymes start to lag a little bit and aren't as effective. So just a few interesting uh, um, points there, why we de decided to build a distillery and why that water source is, is very important when it comes to it. Actually, you'll notice as well with our new bottles, you can see a kind of water effect on the neck and we celebrate that water source as it is so important for our distillery. And we also have, I don't know if you can see it on that camera there, but Loch Nadabi is also etched 
on the back of the bottle there. So in 1995, that's when we first started, uh, when Spirit first ran from our, our, our stills. It was on the 29th of June at 2.29. And as I said, it was the first time in 150 years that we had a legal distilling um, back on the island. So a major milestone. And something interesting about this year as well, at the time, people would have thought our founder, Harold Curry, was mad for opening up a distillery in 1995. So around sort of the late 80s, early 90s, it was actually a recession in, in the whiskey industry and distilleries were actually closing down. So you had Little Mill, Pity Vech, um, a couple of years before that, um, they're actually closing down. So it was quite a bold move at the time for Harold Curry to decide to build a new distillery um, from scratch and also in a place where um, distilling hadn't happened for more than 150 years. Obviously very thankful that he has and 25 years down the line, it's it's definitely a milestone we are, we are celebrating. And just a few other uh, key milestones as well. So the Queen came to open up the um, visitor center in 1997. Um, so we actually have some casks for William and Harry lying in our distillery, which you can, can view in our warehouse when you come on the tour. And in 1998, um, we were opening, we opened up our first cask of whiskey that had, had matured and turned three. So we had Ewan McGregor come um, and uh, celebrate with us. You've got our first distillery manager in the middle, Gordon Mitchell, and Harold Curry there as well. And um, when you come to the distillery, you can also see um, a cask with train spotting written um, on it. And that was a cask gifted to Ewan McGregor on that day. Just to give you a, a modern look, at the distillery so hopefully you guys will be able to come visit when we can all start traveling again we have our lovely visitor center there that is where all the action happens that's where the main bit of the distillery will have the stills and things through there and this is what we call round house which is we've got um, a blending lab there and that's where our distillery manager um, and a few other members of staff live and do their stuff day to day and that brings us very nicely on to our first drama of the evening, which I hope you are enjoying. And this is our Robert Burns malt. So this is a very nice aperitif. I understand that uh, on usual occasions, uh, cleansing ale would be had at the station hotel in order to start off uh, the tasting. But hopefully if you've not had a, a cleansing ale already to start, start your evening off, um, this makes a very nice aperitif to start you off with. It's very nice, fresh, fruity, and it's it's it is very Aaron at its core. You've got lots of like multi notes and a signature thing that I find, especially with Aaron, is it's got that kind of appleiness, and it's something that you should de you'll definitely find in all of our whiskies going through. Now the Robert Burns, the Robert Burns malt, it's um, roughly six years of age, very very smooth. Um, but it does have a very, very nice lingering mouthfeel, um, even though it's only six years old. Now, something that's uh, really cool with our Robert Burns malt is we are um, officially linked with the Burns World Federation. And this uh, started in 1998. So being the distillery with the closest proximity to Robert Burns's uh, birthplace in Ayrshire, uh, we were granted permission to use his face um, and uh, use his name on our bottle, which is something very, very special and something we're very, we're very proud of being the only official bottling allowed to do that. We also have our Robert Burns blend um, that sort of ties in with our Robert Burns uh, range. So this whiskey is a mixture between ex-bourbon casks and ex-sherry casks, leaving, leaning more towards the um, ex-bourbon side of things. It's about 70% ex-bourbon. 
Uh, we don't have any artificial coloring. That's something that we're very proud of with all of our bottlings. We don't add color. It's bottled at 43%, um, so slightly filtered, um, but it still retains lots of those fresh fruity characters, even though, um, even though it has been slightly filtered. It's very, very creamy as well and a lovely whiskey to, to start off the evening with. I think as well, it's quite funny with Robert Burns being a, an excise man, um, he would have probably been responsible for uh, chasing down those uh, illicit distillers who would have been um, across the water from him uh, on Aaron at the time. But I hope uh, you've enjoyed that as your aperitif to start off the tasting. So cheers. And that brings us on to our second dram of the evening. And this takes us to our core range. So as you can see a picture of the bottle. So we launched our new core range at the end of last year. It's hard to believe that's a year ago. A lot has changed uh, in a year. And um, this is the new shape bottle as well. So I'd already pointed out the um, sort of water aspect of it. We've got Lacranza distillery on the, the neck of the bottle because now we've got two distilleries we're making that distinction. Um, with the barrel reserve, it is 43% um, ABV, like um, the Robert Burns malt that we've, we've tried. And this has actually replaced the Lacranza reserve. So who, uh, anyone who is familiar with um, the uh, Lacranza Reserve previously, this is kind of what the Lacranza Reserve has become. This time we have concentrated on the ex-bourbon barrel aspects of our whiskey. So this time it's 100% bourbon barrel matured using fresh first fill bourbon casks. And you'll be able to pick that up straight away when you have a nose. Now, something that um, I find is Aaron in its purest form um, really comes alive with first um, first fill bourbon maturation. Again, you get that really nice, fresh, fruity Aaron note. Lots of uh, lots of apple in particular. And again, it's it's a fairly young expression of Aaron, seven to eight years old. But again, it still kind of still holds its own even uh, being something that's relatively young. So we have got lots of vanilla and coconut as well. So being matured in and first fill bourbon hogsheads, those are the kind of characters, characteristics you are going to get thanks to the American oak um, that's been used to mature the whiskey in. So at Aaron, we use the majority of the casks that we we have in our warehouse are um, ex bourbon barrels. It's probably ranges between seventy to eighty percent. Um, so the round, if you compare that to the like global whiskey industry, about ninety percent of whiskey casks used will be ex bourbon barrels, and there are a few reasons for this. Uh, first of all, there is a much more steady supply. Say if in comparison to um, X sherry casks. Um, and this is because when, where we get the X bourbon barrels from is the US. And in the US, they can only use uh, the bourbon casks once. So they use virgin oak casks over in the States. They fill it once for their use. And then the casks can come to us in Scotland um, or and other places in the world for filling to mature whiskey. And this is because just after prohibition, um, the American Union of Coopers basically wanted to make sure, <laughs> definitely a breakfast whiskey, I agree with you there, Brian. Um, so the Union of Coopers basically wanted to make sure they'd safeguarded uh, jobs for not only the Coopers themselves, but also um, the places where they were getting the wood from for making the casks. They wanted to safeguard those jobs. And for that reason, um, 
they passed a law where these casks could only be used once, which is great for us, which means there's a nice steady flow of bourbon barrels heading our way for some whiskey maturation. Now, the, the oak used is something called white oak, Quercus alba, or American oak, um, and it's ideal for short-term maturation, um, um, just as be given, sorry, given the size of the casks, which are 180 litres, the ex bourbon barrels, um, it's ideal for short term maturation because there's much more uh, liquid to wood uh, ratio. The ratio is bigger for liquid to wood, which means um, this gives you a slightly quicker um, maturation. And these also really bring to the fore these um, lovely flavours of vanilla, honey, coconut, which again, complement uh, the Aran style very, very well. Again, um, being 43%, it still has a really nice long finish to it. So if, interestingly, the Lacranza Reserve was actually designed as a, a whiskey for the supermarkets, which is why we have uh, brought down the ABV slightly. But I hope you're enjoying it all at home. Now we've seen um, sort of the uh, Aran malt in a, a completely um, sort of ex bourbon barrel maturation sense, which takes us really nicely on. Now I'd heard something like that as well, just seeing Bob Watson's question about the Americans repealed the one use law. Um, I'm not sure, I'm not entirely sure if that's happened in um, completely, I've heard like, instances where it's certainly been talked about um so i'm not 100 percent sure um but I've, I've heard it can be it will be heading that way certainly in certain areas but we'll see what hopefully that uh, will still get a, a nice steady flow thank you very much bob it's a great job glad you're enjoying it <laughs> Now we've seen, as I said, we've seen the um, Aran whiskey character, Aran spirit character with 100% bourbon uh, influence. I'd like to sort of draw your attention to the third whiskey that you've got in your tasting packs, which is our Aran 10 year old. Now this time, um, like the Robert Burns malt that we tried at the beginning, it's a mixture of ex bourbon and ex sherry casks. And this, um, plays with the Aran character, again, in a slightly different way. Now with our Aran 10, um, my colleague Andy Bell considers this a back bar staple, and I 100% agree with him. It's one that's uh, certainly a must have for the whiskey cabinet. It's 46% and it's really kind of the flagship part of our range. It's one that really um, shows off the Aran character. And as I said, especially because we've got the two sides Ryan, what do you have in your hand? That looks uh, very nice indeed. And I'm, I'm alive. Um, what we've agreed with um, indie brands who are the company who market Aaron is for the tasting, they've been good enough to give us a promotion on the Aaron gift pack. So you are getting your Aaron 10, but for the same price as the Aaron 10, we're giving away the gift pack that's got two lovely tasting glasses in the inside as well. So it's extra value for money. And at this price, it's it's a bargain of the month, to be perfectly honest. Um, so not only is the whiskey fantastic, you get the added value of the gift pack when you order on the lockdown order sheet. Um, we've got limited stock. So um, if you like this whiskey, at the end of the evening, get onto the website and order it and we can reserve it for you. So while stocks last, hope you're listening. Hope you're listening. <laughs> there you go. Very nice gift pack it is to you. <laughs> <laughs> Take me off it. Lovely. Well, now, you know, you've been tempted by the Aaron 10 in that lovely presentation box that uh, Brian showed us. Hopefully you're also getting a chance to try it and have moved on to the third whiskey. 
Now, our Aaron 10 year old uh, is our flagship drum. The first time we released uh, the Aaron 10 was back in 2006. Um, now we've got it in the new presentation um, bottle. And this time it's slightly more sherried than the last uh, batches, I believe. So now we've got sort of 70% bourbon, 30% sherry. And I think it was slightly, um, the bourbon influence is slightly more in some of the previous uh, batches that we've done. And it's something that really highlights our spirit character as well. So we've kind of seen it from a, a very kind of pure sense with our barrel reserve, but now we've got a slightly extra kind of spicy layer there, thanks to the sherry cask influence. And something that I'd really like to talk about when we're enjoying, hopefully enjoying the uh, Aaron 10, is talking about our spirit character and kind of a little bit of um, a background to, to why Aaron tastes like it does. And this whole development of the Aaron spirit character, that really nice fresh fruity apple multi uh, character is down to a man called Gordon Mitchell, which is this man on the, thank you very much, Brian. Um, a guy called Gordon Mitchell. And this is our first uh, distillery manager. And obviously setting up a distillery from scratch, he had um, the job to craft um, so the Aaron identity, the Aaron spirit and that Aaron stamp. And seeing how his legacy has developed over 25 years is absolutely magical because you know that Aaron stamp's there and you can see it in um, every sort of Aaron bottle you have. And that's something I love about the Aaron range. I really like this this Aaron 10. I like, I mean, I'm a, a bit of a sucker for a, a sherried whiskey, but uh, it's it's nice to have kind of a bit more of the sherry influence as well. <laughs> they tend to do that. Mine tend to do that too. Seeing Eric saying his uh, bottles tend to uh, evaporate, mine do at quite a, a speedy rate as well. Um, so talking about like the Aaron Spirit character and uh, Gordon Mitchell's uh, influence, there are a few things and, and little tweaks he's done during production, which kind of really bring out um, that nice sort of fresh, fruity um, um, character that's, that, that's very known for Aaron. Thank you very much. Uh, that the, uh, the new style bottle has been very, very well received since uh, we've redesigned and it's kind of really, um, spruced up some of our branding as well so there are a couple of main reasons why we get this this fresh fruity character when it comes to our iron spirits and it's down to little little sort of tweaks here and there that we do in our production that give us our individual character each distillery will do this um, and the first thing is down to our fermentation so this is a little just a uh, to start you off a little snapshot from our distillery so when you go up the stairs and pass our mill and um, you look straight into our distillery it's all open plan and it's all in one room so it's it's quite nice to see and you get that total effect there so on the right we've got our uh, mash tun and then to the left you see where we have our washbacks where all the fermentation happens and these we have six washbacks in total made from oregon pine so we've gone for a more traditional style and it's in this uh, part of the process where we start to really tease out some of those fresh fruity characters. And this is because we've got a slightly longer maturation. So our maturation, uh, sorry, not maturation, our fermentation um, period lasts between 52 and like 110 hours, which for the whiskey industry is, is quite long. And when uh, the fermentation lasts a bit longer, this starts to kind of build up some of those flavor compounds that we look for and the esters start to form and you get some of those fresh fruity um, characters building um, during the fermentation stage where we make what's similar to a beer, like a strong beer before we take that to the next stage, which is the distillation. So it's during this part that we start to kind of tease out some of those flavors, which is very important. And the next stage takes us to another key, um, key part of our process. Thank you, Alan. Um, another key part of our process that starts to, to kind of bring that really light character to our spirits. And um, this is a little snapshot from sort of our uh, two stills as they were 
Um, but in 2017, we actually doubled production uh, and added two more stills. So when you come and uh, visit us, hopefully when you next can, um, this is what you'll see when you enter um, sort of the working part of the distillery and see the stills. Now, the first thing you'll notice is the shape. Now, to, in order to kind of um, encourage a, a much lighter spirit, you want a line arm that is either ascending or horizontal. So you can kind of see that ours are slightly ascending, but pretty much almost horizontal. And why this is important for creating a lighter spirit is basically when we start to heat up um, that wash that we've we've created in the fermentation, that strong beer, um, it, when you boil it, the, the vapor has to work much harder to escape out of the line arm. And this encourages something called reflux. So what happens is when the vapor starts to rise, it has more of a chance of not quite making it to the line arm, the swan neck there, and actually will recondense back into a liquid and fall back into the still. And this encourages more copper contact. And this is something that we want to encourage as much as possible because this strips off the sort of like heavier, meatier um, characters that you'll get with a spirit. So if you compare our stills to say that of McAllen, McAllen will be very much facing down the way. They want to avoid reflux and they want that heavier, more oily, meaty spirit. We want the opposite. So that's why our line arm is going that way. Another thing that we do to encourage as much of this uh, copper contact as possible to give us that lighter spirit is we actually heat up our stills very slowly. So we kind of run our stills at about six uh, litres per minute, I believe, six, seven litres per minute, um, which is very slow um, in terms of uh, like in, in, the, in a distilling sense. And again, that will give you lots of those lovely copper um, that lovely of copper contact and uh, to give you a very nice uh, light spirit and it's something that you really really pick up with our lovely Arrington. And it all comes together very nicely again with that sort of dual maturation of using the bourbon casks but also the the sherry casks there. Love that kind of spiciness just at the end as well. Very faint, but it's um, it's lovely. And there is the Aaron Ten there. Again, another thing that I want to highlight with our range is something that we're very proud of is we never add color um, to our whiskey. So um, every bottle that you see, and it, especially when it comes on to looking at some of the, the wine cask finishes later on, you get some absolutely amazing colors, but that is all down to the wood that we use. Fantastic. I hope we're all getting warmed up with these lovely three drams, but we're gonna kick it up a notch with the fourth one on show and this is our quarter cask or also known as the bothy so we've seen aaron uh, previously uh, with our second dram from a very much uh, american oak bourbon barrel focus so this is kind of taking the same sort of theme uh, but this time we have done a couple of things differently first of all we've uh, kicked it up to cask strength at 56.2 percent so as we are sort of approaching the end of november when it's starting to get a bit chillier what better way than to warm yourself up with a cask strength whiskey now i love the cask strength part of the range as well uh, before working for aaron i worked for an independent bottler where pretty much all of the whiskies were cask strength. And it's it's nice to see a car a, a car strength whiskey because you kind of see it at a very kind of raw form. And again, you get lots of flavors and characters from that. Um, if you do have some water to hand, please do feel free to add it to a cask strength whiskey if you'd like, um, obviously depending on how you take your whiskey. 
Now this time, uh, the casks have, have had a dual maturation. So the first part of the maturation stage happens for eight years in first fill bourbon casks. So the ones similar to the ones that I'd spoken about when we looked at the barrel reserve. These are first fill, so nice and sort of punchy and, and fresh casks. And then after that, we do something that adds an extra layer of spice and kind of complexity to that whiskey as we put it in a different type of cask. This happens for two years and it's called a quarter cask, which is the nice link uh, between the name there. So a quarter cask is a 125 liter cask, so much smaller. And when we put the whiskey in the second cask, it gives you a second maturation, but a quicker maturation. Again, there's more contact there with the liquid and the woods, which gives you really nice sort of spicy, almost like tropical fruit layers um, on top of that. On the nose in particular, you get sort of that fresh woody, woody note, which I think is absolutely lovely. Again, a bit of fruitiness there. And when you sip it, it kind of is a massive burst of fruit again. But this time, instead of having kind of, as well as having your apple, like classic Aaron character, I do feel it almost kind of edges towards a tropical note. So you've got a bit of banana and a bit of pineapple. That's the, those are the, the kind of flavors that I associate with our quarter cask. And again, it sort of adds that extra, extra layer, extra dimension to the whiskey. This again is non-chill filtered and a natural color. And again, that sort of 56.2% ABV gives a nice sort of spiciness, but it's also not too overpowering as well. Very sugary, the bursts of flavor. And it's, it, I don't know if anyone has uh, any of their uh, barrel reserve left in their glass, um, but it's quite an interesting one to compare it um, given that sort of bourbon character of um, urban sort of style Aaron character but this kind of with the, that kind of next dimension of obviously being the cask strength but also the intense second maturation in the 125 litre quarter cask and a few other sort of um, bits I always like to talk about when we talk about the bothy or quarter cask so you notice it's got like a second part to the name and there are some reasons behind this. So I don't know if um, some of you might be familiar with our old style bottles. If we look at the Bothy uh, quarter cask, this was so the quarter, this is our new quarter cask now. And the old style bottle is the one that you can see just in the sort of left hand side of the screen there. And the Bothy was named after this cottage called Lagan Cottage, which is actually found on the Isle of Arran. Um, myself, Mariella, and my colleague Andy decided to walk there once from La Cranza. Took uh, two and a half hours of uh, braving the bracken and uh, a decent uh, trek to this little secluded cottage. I also got sunburnt at the time, believe it or not. So I love uh, throwing that story in when I go abroad and say, well, you see, you do get sun in Scotland. Uh, you can get sunburnt. It's happened to me. Um, but after this two and a half hour trek, uh, trek we found Lagan Cottage. And it was quite cool having the bottle there and seeing that image of uh, that bothy um, on the bottle, but also having the bothy there in front of you. Um, and also another kind of little link there as well <laughs> is um, that having these you've got actually quite a few of these little bothies uh, dotted around the island and these would have been sort of the hub of activity for some of this illicit distilling you'd have these little houses sort of tucked away in um behind, like in the sort of mountainous bits of Arran, uh, good ways to hide and and not be caught by the excise man so it's again just a nice little link back to our history um and a nice little bit of marketing there um, another thing as well to mention is being the quarter cask size, these casks, uh, size casks would have often been used around this time um, to, well, around the time of the illicit distilling because these casks were much easier to tuck away and hide, but also to transport off uh, the island 
so um again a nice little sort of nod to that uh, distilling past and to a bit of Aaron's history as well um, in terms of uh, whiskey production. Um, another thing as well, so we've got this um, Aaron uh, sort of like the Lagan cottage that you can see on the bottle. Uh, so we've actually translated that to the new packaging. So if you can it's slightly watermarked. I think it's mainly on the, actually the outer case of the uh, quarter cask bottle. I wonder if you can see it. If I go back to the previous slide. This little mark you'll find on the outer casing of our uh, bothy as well, because we wanted to kind of incorporate that to the new packaging. Um, but we're mainly focusing on the kind of quarter cask element this time around as we felt like this really kind of encapsulated what the product was about with that second maturation. Um, but it's a nice little sort of, again, a nod to uh, that place on Aaron the Lagan Cottage um, that is sort of part of the kind of the heritage behind the, the bottle itself. Hope you're enjoying it. Try to get this. Does anybody have any questions at all? Um, I understand that we are gearing up for some cheese and biscuits as we come to our our break. I can put me back on at the moment. Yeah, that was very, very interesting. Uh, very good. Excellent whiskies, I have to say. Um, the reason that we've put up uh, the Aaron gift pack is that somebody's ordered the Aaron 10, but mm -hmm. you went the, they went onto the website and ordered Aaron 10. Mm -hmm. So instead of getting the gift pack, um, they've ordered the ordinary one, so we can, for the person who's done that, or the couple of people who have done that, we can sort that out um, when you come and pick your whiskey up. So for those of you who do want to order the gift pack, please go down to lockdown and you'll get the, the gift pack at its... Um, lockdown into the search bar. Into the search, lockdown into the search bar, you'll get that um, at the special price. Lucy was talking about the old style bottles, and um, we've all seen... The new style. So this is just a tease of one of the raffle prizes. <laughs> and I think it's, I would say it's now a collector's item. This is the old style bottle. Cask finish. Um, this is Cote Ruti cask, cask finish, which is from the Rhone Valley in France. And this is the last bottle that we have. And this is going into the raffle. A very nice bottle it is too. It is. It's very nice to drink. But what we've found is since Aaron changed their bottling, mm -hmm. <coughs> people are buying the old style bottles. Oh, um, interesting. Like the Amarone finish, Marsala yeah. finish, and Madeira mm -hmm. finish, etc. Yeah. Um, because these are obviously not going to be repeated. They're gone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, true. So whoever, whoever wins this... Um, two options drink it <laughs> I'll know where you live because I've done the raffles I'll know where you stay and we can drink it together um, or just keep it stick it uh, stick it away for a rainy day and see what happens if you put it into auction because um, it'd be interesting to see the fact that this is the, this is the last one but that's just a wee tease of one of the prizes in the raffle um, and also before we go to the break um Aaron have just uh, launched um, uh, a private cask for Indy, which is Indy Brands, uh, who sell it. And it's a 12-year-old that's been aged in Tuscan red wine casks from Italy. Um, we got a small allocation. I think there's only about 227, 240 bottles available. Yeah. yeah. And... <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> 
I'm laughing because I was actually going to bring a couple of bottles up to do the raffle to let people mm -hmm. get a chance to do it, but we've, we've sold most of it in two days. <laughs> so there's no point doing it in the raffle when we can sell it um, anyway. But for those of you who are interested in it, it's a 12-year-old. It's £80 a bottle. Uh, it's a limited edition. It's a one-off. And it's been aged in Italian red wine casks for two years. That is on the website. It's nothing to do with the tasting. It's just a point of um, interest. And to celebrate 25 years, Aaron launched a limited edition of the 25-year-old Aaron. That's just literally headed out yeah. to the warehouse. Yeah, yeah well, um, we got our allocation of six bottles. Sounds about right. <laughs> yeah. Did. And I actually said to Cam, do you know what? I think I think I'll buy one of those because it's quite unique. It's the first bottling of the 25-year-old. And Cam mm -hmm. says, well, it was £295. And Cam went, well, do you know what? If you want it, buy it. I said, fair enough. She says, but you're wasting your breath. Why is that? She said, we've sold them in a day. There we go. Yeah, it's... Uh... There you go. Huh? Such such a demand for Aaron. Yeah. I know, and uh, 25 year old as well. It's uh, absolutely yeah. insane to believe that we're a distillery that's 25, considering yeah. uh, everything really and being a young young distillery. Yeah, and, and such is a demand, as I said, it never even touched the shelves. Basically, it came in the front door and went out the front door the same day and um, dispatch, which is great for business, but um, <laughs> not if I wanted a bottle, it didn't. But anyway, uh, thank you, Lucy, for your. Oh, one minute. Is Aaron going to bring back the 12-year-old? Well, there you go, Lucy. 12-year-old. That's a very good question. I actually am not entirely sure. I believe that the tw there was, the, is it the 12-year-old cast strength you're meaning, David? Or the, but I know that there was a 12-year-old cast strength there that I think the boffy kind of to replace that kind of concept. But I'm not entirely sure about any other plans for sort of the 12-year-old as part of the core range yet. But who knows, it might be uh, something entered in a little bit further down the line. So watch this I think, space. I think the problem with that is if you, if you do do a 12-year-old, there's less stock available for your 18. Mm -hmm. Could well you're, be. You're taking tasks away for the future. Um, no. Uh, anyway, uh, thank you for that. We'll have no we'll problem. Have, we'll have a twenty-minute break, folks. Cheese and biscuits, or a cigarette break, a drink break. Nick, a couple of cans of lager. Have a cigarette break. Have your cheese and biscuits. Have a pea break. Whatever. Uh, and we'll see you in about twenty minutes, so we can uh, chill out for twenty minutes. We'll see you shortly, Lucy. Yes, yeah, see you shortly. Yep. Thank you very much. Cheers, folks.
Well, good evening, folks. I um, hope you've, en you've enjoyed your break. Um, before we get Lucy on, we're just going to have a bit of fun. I think we're going to do, when we're talking about Miss Whiskey, um, and I think we're just going to do the raffle for this one at the moment. Okay, so before Lucy starts the second half, just for a bit of fun, a bit of excitement, um, Karen will draw out a number. We'll put your coming so they can see. Oh, no. There you go. Hi. <laughs> so, there we go, folks. Right, so I'll draw it. We have a ticket. We have a ticket. Okay. For this whiskey here. Four, eight, zero. Four eight zero is G Mac. Four eight zero. That's what that says. G Mac. G McNab. Four eight zero. G McNab. Well done. That's the first one done. We'll just lay that aside. And we'll put four eight zero against that one. So anyway, that that's. Let's leave that there now. Okay, um, so um, I hope you've enjoyed your break. That was four very interesting uh, drams, very nice drams, and a nice uh, history about Arn. And I'm sure when things get back together, when things get back together, we will certainly be visiting Arn without a doubt. Yes. Um, and the other the other thing is that uh, just when I'm on, a lot of people are saying if we ever get back to normal, um, will we still be doing the um, tastings we're doing at the moment online? The answer is yes. I. Some people prefer the tastings online. They don't have to travel too far. Um, so if it, <laughs> it will probably come to the fact if we do a tasting, it will be at the station hotel as normal. Following week, it will be at the Traquir Arms as normal with a smaller group. People like the social aspect of whiskey tastings and joining together and sitting with friends and having a yacht and catching up the times and putting the world to rights. Um, and yes, if that means it's a third Friday and we we'll have to do a online tasting when, well, so be it. That's the way it goes. I've got the best job in the world. Not a bad job at all, Brian. <laughs> Can you imagine doing three <laughs> nights with one teaspoon? Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> anyway, Lucy, I hope you're fully charged, ready to go for the second half. Definitely. Yes, yeah, stage is all yours. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So, Karen, can I get you to help me share my screen once again? That would be brilliant. Thank you very much. Well, welcome back, guys. I hope you've uh, had your fill of cheese and crackers. I understand that's kind of part of the halftime show. Also, congratulations uh, to the winner of the coat roti. You will not be disappointed. It's a fantastic guest cast finish. And also slightly different having sort of the coat roti being the red wine that's a uh, red wine cask that's being used to finish it. Uh, just before I carry on with the next four, I found my prop. Um, this is the little etching of where's the camera of the bothy on the new packaging uh, like I outlined um from my screen so if you can see it there um uh so you'll see that when you purchase a bottle of this lovely quarter cask uh bothy and also I noticed there was another uh question that we missed just before we went to the break and it was how old is the quarter cask whiskey so the initial start of the maturation is for eight years in first fill uh, bourbon hogsheads and then it's finished for another two years in the quarter cask so it's about nine ten years old uh, all together but I hope that uh, answers that one for you right so let's get cracking with the uh, next whiskey of the evening which is an Amarone wine cask finish in the lovely new packaging that uh, is was released not too long ago. So again kind of really uh, encapsulating that idea of being a red wine 
uh, cask finish with all the colouring. Uh, something that I um, hadn't mentioned as well before about our new bottles is we've also got with our new packaging, you'll notice on the label, if I can bring it up a bit to the camera, is we've actually got Braille on our new range, which is a nice new addition. I believe we're the, the only whiskey distillery to, to do that. I bring it up to the screen just there. Uh, which is a really cool little detail as well that we've added to our our new packaging. It's something to to look out for when you when you buy our bottles. Now, taking us on to a, an, a, another part of our range is our wine cask finishes. So part of our our sort of core three that we have our Amarone, our Port, and also our Sautern. Um, but we're going to kick off with the Amarone wine cask and also very nicely paired as well after cheese. I can imagine you often have that sort of wine uh, cheese pairing. Now, interestingly, with our wine cask finishes from the very early stages of uh, the products we released, um, we had actually released a succession in the very early days of Aaron of wine cask finishes. Every time I go to a whiskey fair, um, um, all over the world someone always says oh I've, I've come across a champagne finish or a margot finish from the very early days of Aaron so around this time and um, time that sort of Gordon Mitchell would have been our distillery manager because we're a young distillery and sort of slowly building up capital it was a case of kind of filling whatever sort of cask you could get your your hands on almost and because of that there was a lot of experimentation in the early days with these lovely wine cask finishes and now we've kind of brought them together as those three that you'll find um, as part of the Aaron range nowadays. And that brings us on to our lovely Amarone. Now, the first uh, thing you'll notice right away is that beautiful colour. Um, something that's really become a part of like our like core value, if you'd like, is the importance of our wood policy. And that's something that uh, um, our current um, master distiller, James McTaggart, brought to the table when he joined the company um, back in 2007. And it's really kind of enforcing the idea behind the importance of having really good quality casks to fill um, your spirit with. And the first thing is being um, a, a company that do not add color to our whiskey. We get 100% of that color from the woods. And you can see right away, it's had an amazing effect on uh, the Amarone cask finish in particular. And also with the woods, um, you're gonna get roughly 70 to 80% of the flavor from the wood as well. So having that really um, strict and, and um, strict cask policy as, as part of your ethos is, is very important because it's gonna bring those lovely flavors um, to kind of mingle with your spirit character. So the whiskey we're drinking is our Amarone cask finish and it is at four, uh, 50 percent ABV. Now this was um, a um, choice done by James McTaggart. He chose to do a 50 percent ABV because it, he felt like it really kind of added the balance between the um, sort of spirit character of Aaron and also the character of the wine cask, which is, is quite bold in itself. So you'll notice on the nose, it's, it's still fresh and fruity, but it's almost got that uh, sort of layer of those red fruits like cherries. And that's kind of that little sort of emphasis from the wine coming through. Again, mirrored on the, um, on the palette. You get slight slight hints of chocolate as well. You you do get almost that kind of red wine uh, sensation a little bit when you um, when you take a sip, but it's still kind of fresh and fruity. And I'm managing to get that balance between the Aaron fruitiness and that aspect of the cask is is something that James has done an amazing job um, with these uh, wine finishes that we have. If I let you into a little secret before I actually joins Aaron. I wouldn't have usually said I was a, a wine finished whiskey fan because it's such um, often you'll find it's such a punchy, powerful cask that it will really like mask the spirit character. But 
James has managed, James McTaggart, our um, master's distiller, has really managed to kind of get the perfect balance between the two, where you've still got that Aran identity there, even um, which holds up very well against that red wine cask. And also keeping the ABV at 50% has really um, helped there too. Again, with um, the importance of having very good quality casks is also to have a very um, good quality source. So with our Amarone finish, we're really lucky to use, uh, to work with a producer called Allegrini. Um, so it's a producer of Amarone um, red wine from Northern Italy and Veneto. And they're a family uh, run company that have been producing wine since the 16th century. So really special to be able to, to work with these guys and also to be able to use their casks um, with our production. So something very, very special there. An absolute delicious, delicious dram. And it's, it's one that also lingers if you, if you wait a little bit, it's still got, it still like holds its, itself in on the palate when you when you drink it and it's interesting to see so we've we've already seen kind of the effect that Gordon Mitchell has had in, in sort of crafting the Aaron identity and it's something that James has really brought to the table being able to kind of add that sort of next step in sort of the growth of Aaron and, and our distilling um to kind of really enforce this idea between um of wood policy and here is James here. You might have sort of come across him before. This is James McTaggart. And he joined us from Bowmore in, in 2007 and holds over 40 years of, of whiskey distilling experience. So it's been absolutely fantastic, um, obviously, seeing what he's brought to the product. How long is the, the finishing period? That's a very good question. So in terms of the maturation, we start off by maturing the whiskey for six years in hogsheads, which are 250 litre casks. Um, and then after this six year period, we'll put it in um, the wine cask for between sort of 12 to 18 months or thereabouts. So again, it's just, it's getting that kind of right element of time in, in the wine cask, so you're not overshadowing um sort of initial spirit character and also being a very light spirit character um or the the spirit character being very light that we have um it actually works very well with finishing but again kind of making sure you you tweak it enough to get the right balance is is so important and yeah these are some of the casks that we have in in our warehouse so we actually have a um, several different types of warehouses that we the use on on Aaron. So we've got Dunnage, the more traditional style, as you can see. We also use palletized warehouse for some of the stock that we're going to kind of tuck away um, and keep maturing for a while. And then we also have uh, this style of racking. Um, we use um, we have two warehouses with this style and um, some hold our private casks that we do. You can notice um, we've got the train spotting cask just uh, in that right corner. But this is also the type of uh, warehouse that we have where we hold our wine finishes as well. So the likes of our Amarone, our Port, our Sautern will be held in warehouse number six. Um, which is where we, we have those uh, casks tucked away. But again, just an interesting way to, to combine both styles and also something that um, I forgot to mention at the beginning of uh, the tasting is we're really lucky to be an independent distillery. So we are owned by, by shareholders, but it means that when it comes to kind of the, when it comes to de developing the, the style of, of our whiskey, we have um, a lot of say in what we want to do and we kind of make the whiskey that we want to make, which is something very special. And it means that we, we have lots of chances to play with these lovely different uh, cask finishes as well, just to see what direction that takes our whiskey, whether it be 
Amarone, a lovely uh, red wine from northern Italy, or say the Cote Roti, uh, which we had just seen before, which is a slightly different style. And it's just interesting to see how that kind of plays with that Aran identity, even though that Aran identity is still there. And also you would have seen in the video as well earlier, we've got a new member of, well, fairly new member of the team. A year seems to go very quickly, but we have our new distillery manager, David Livingston, who's also joined us from Isla. So he joined at the end of last year. And between himself and James, they have over 60 years of experience uh, being brought to the table, which is something pretty special. Uh, David Livingston also joins us from Isla, believe it or not. Um, and he um, was working for Ardnaho before joining us. So it's great to have sort of this like mixture of, of experience and we're really looking forward to seeing what David brings to the table. We've seen this little sort of ladder of legacy. Um, we've seen with Gordon Mitchell and the spirit style, uh, James with the wood policy. He's also brought a lot of modernization to the distillery. We didn't have a mill believe it or not, until 2008. So we um, we don't actually malt our barley on site. So we use a company called Crisp on the east coast of Scotland. So we buy in our malt, uh, malted barley to use. But before we were also uh, buying our barley, before 2008, we were buying our barley pre-milled as well. So, um, so that wasn't until 2008. Um, and it's really just interesting to see how step by step um, each of our distillery managers have been adding uh, to our distillery and modernizing. So we'll see what happens in the next 25 years um, with the work that David is, is putting in um, along with um, everything else that's been happening the 25 years preceding that. I hope you're enjoying the Amarone and I, I wonder if you're sort of picking up those kind of wine notes as well. Nothing too up overpowering, but it's it's certainly there. Um, for those um, people who don't know about wines or Italian wines, um, Amarone, as Lucy said, is from <clears throat> northern Italy, but it's a very powerful um, red wine. The alcohol basically is 14 to 16 point percent it's a full-bodied um, Italian red wines and what they do is that they lay the grapes out uh, in the sun so that they can dry out that gives them a, a more concentrated flavor increases the alcohol content and Amarone is not basically a cheap wine and I think that reflects in the cost of the casks because mm -hmm. if you get a uh, a good Italian producer of Amarone, um, like anything else, the casks won't be um, cheap. Uh, mm -hmm. The Amarones that we sell in the shop, I think we do three, maybe four, um, they range between £25 and £50 a bottle. So that gives you an idea of the quality of the wine that was in the cask um, before um, mm -hmm. the whiskey was put into it. So, aye, a good choice, a good choice. Amarone is, well, probably one, one of my favourite wines, one of the family's favourite wines. Unfortunately for me, it's one of the family's <laughs> favourite wines. Um, but, but that, Lucy, reflects in the colour and um, the finish of this wine. It's fantastic. Absolutely. This, this whiskey is just the bee's knees. No, it's certainly, um, it's, it's just amazing, again, like, once you leave it a little bit, just almost to have that kind of, almost like the tannins that you'd get from the wine kind of lingering on the palate. It's just, a, it's kind of a nice balance between the two. Yeah. They retain, oh, between that Aaron. Uh, no, great. So, yep, love that one. And again, kind of like, taking on that idea of, of finishing it this on to our second style which is has also been uh, finished in a second in in a sim, in a similar manner so again we've started off the maturation for six years in these hogsheads and these 250 liter casks these would have been um american oak hogsheads um, and then we put them this time for our our next 
second whiskey, uh, or well, not, it's our uh, sixth whiskey, technically, uh, which is our Ports Cask finish, which again is the new in the new design. And this time, this label was chosen um, to actually reflect the concept behind a a ports bottle you know often they are black with right white writing on so that kind of design was incorporated in the new packaging both on the bottle and also on the tube itself so it's quite quite interesting to see now this time with the ports um we've used casks previously from uh, graham's ports which is a um, Graham's Tourney Ports. Um, I think currently we also get um, casks from Speyside Cooperage as well, old port casks. We've also worked with these artisan producers before um, to kind of, again, play with that wine cask finish element, but uh, with a kind of port twist. Again, taking this, uh, the sort of using a port cask finish would also accompany the cheeses that you'll have just had very nicely because uh, cheese and port is an epic com um, combination as well. So you've got the, this double maturation once again. But again, it, it, it also adds something different to what you will have tried with the Amarone cask. You obviously get sort of those lovely like clove elements and always those really like dark raisin fruits that you get with port. It's almost a little bit more leathery on the palate this time um, compared to the Amarone, which is a slightly bit more fruity. And you also get sort of hints, lots of citrus as well. Again, that's kind of current coming from more of the Aran side of things. But again, it's just uh, playing with that Aaron character. And this is actually my favorite out of the uh, the three uh, cask finishes that we have. I just think it kind of gets those that sort of flavor combination just, just right. So Ports is a, um, a fortified wine from Portugal, usually coming from the Douro Valley. And something that I love about having a Ports cask finish as part of our range as it really also celebrates uh, the relationship between Scotland um, and um, a different Scotland, the whiskey industry, but also an, another industry, which is the port industry. So quite a lot of the uh, port producers, um, or at least their ancestors, had Scottish blood in them. So you've got Grahams, uh, you've got the Symingtons, you've got Coburns, all these wonderful port producers, producers have the Scottish heritage and and Scottish link to them. So I think that's a really nice way of kind of like tying it back in to whis whiskey and whiskey production in Scotland. And it's it's a pretty cool, cool link to have there. Once again, uh, the port cask has also had a great influence on the colour of the whiskey, a really nice sort of dark hue to it. Slightly reddish as well. But again, having those really good quality uh, port casks have, have influenced the whiskey in that way. And also, of course, on, um, on the palate as well of the whiskey. Now with port as well, it's, 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 a, it's a product that I find very interesting, not only for the linkage with, with Scotland, but uh, just how kind of that um, industry sort of developed in the trade. It really opened up the trade uh, with the UK and and Portugal as well. And what they will have done as well before taking the port from Portugal, they will have often um, fortified it with brandy or other alcohol um, for the voyage time in order for it to get from Portugal to the UK. Just a little bit of history behind that port cask. <laughs> it's really interesting comparing the two and, and that's the beauty of a tasting as well especially when you've got such a lovely um, and varied lineup is sometimes again you can go back to the previous whiskey you've tried but you will notice sort of comparing the two with the Amarone and then the port it, it does sort of take um, that style in, in, in different directions but it's definitely a bit more leathery um, and just again, it's got a little bit more 
um, sort of depth, I think, to it than the Amarone, but that's that's given sort of the style of cask that uh, will have been used uh, for that secondary maturation. Again, kept at 50%. And again, James has done a fantastic job in order to not sort of overshadow one part from the other. It's a really nice uh, sort of mixture between the two. And it's a really lovely collection and they've done a, a stunning job also with that new packaging there. So it's interesting, this is also taking on a bit of like a geographical journey with uh, sort of Scotland, obviously, mixed since we can't travel, we've kind of gone down to the Italian, Italian routes, the Portuguese routes. And that brings us on to the next one, which is actually one of my favorites from the range. And this time it's gonna take you down the sort of Spanish roots um, with a more of a sherry focus. Now our sherry cask bodega was one, uh, also a brand, is also a brand new product that was introduced to the range last year. And it's the first time we've had a sherry cask strength as part of our core range. I certainly know that when Ewan Mitchell, our managing director told me we were going to get a sherry cask strength, I was over the moon. I love a sherried whiskey, but I also love, um, as I said earlier, cast strength whiskey and it together very, very well. So this time we've got uh, an iron whiskey that's been maturing for approximately eight years and it's been maturing in first fill sherry hogsheads. Being that first fill, again, you get that punchiness there. You get a lot of that sort of oak character, the wood character on the nose. And you also start to get those kind of like those flavors that you do associate with sherry coming through all the kind of fruitiness. Lots of fig as well on the nose in particular. This one too is a cast strength, so it's 55.8% ABV. So don't be afraid to add some water if you'd like to, um, just to kind of tease out more of those flavors. Also, on the, as soon as you take a sip, you get that massive burst of flavor, very fruity. But again, at a whiskey at 55.8%, you don't necessarily get that bite that you would expect. And it just lingers very, very nicely on the palate. And so sherry is something that I'm, I'm very interested in. And I think you know the, the relationship between sherry casks and the sherry industry is, is something definitely worth um exploring further so I'm a big sherry fan as it is um and it's interesting to see the kind of sherry casks that are used uh, when it comes to um maturing your whiskey so these uh casks that were used for our sherry cask bodega our first fill sherry hog said so 205 uh, 250 liter casks and the casks that we would have used for these the sherry casks are something um, called pre-seasoned casks. Now these were a, a special sort of sherry cask developed kind of towards uh, the 1980s, early uh, 1990s. And the reason behind this was um, is as follows. So if you take some of our older stock um, that's been maturing at Aaron, so take our 25, our 18, our 21, would have used sherry casks um, at that time, but they would most likely be something called ex bodega casks. So these are casks that would have been used to mature sherry wines in Jerez in the south of Spain. But now, uh, but these casks became more rare after the Consejo Regulador, which is like the governing body of sherry wines, basically put a stop to um, sherry export in bulk i.e. in the cask and they put a stop to that um, at that time which meant that distillers um, would have to go over to Spain to source the casks themselves and after this what happened was uh, a, a different type of sherry cask this pre-season cask was designed to basically help um, keep up the demand for these type of casks so with these casks, they're made from, these pre-season casks are made from new oak. 
Um, and they can either be made from Quercus alba, the white oak, that American oak uh, that we will have seen with ex-bourbon barrels. So we would have seen this type of oak with the barrel reserve, the quarter cask, um, to give you those nice kind of like vanilla notes um, and coconut notes. This is actually the type of wood that traditional sherry casks would um, have been made from um, for maturing these sherry wines. Also, you can um, get these pre-season casks made from European oak, Quercus roba. Um, so this will give you a slightly different style when it comes to maturing your whiskey. Um, so this will give you kind of raisins, sultanas. Funny enough, more of those kind of flavors you probably associate uh, with sherry itself. Um, and having these two types of oak casks that you can use for maturing your whiskey um, means that it gives like the distiller lots of flexibility when it comes to maturing their whiskey. You can also use two types of, of size as well when it comes to ordering your um, pre-season cask. These often come in either 250 litre casks, these hogsheads that would have been used for maturing the sherry cask bodega, or you can have them at the traditional 500 litre um, sized casks and um, these are called sherry butts and these are what uh, these are the type of casks that they would have shipped sherry over in the cask um, using these kind of casks uh, when this was allowed and it's really interesting to kind of go back and see um, how long we've been kind of using these sherry casks for we actually we don't know exactly when the first sherry cask was used in order to, to mature whiskey. Um, but a guy called William Sanderson was recorded saying in 1986, um, basically talking, he, this is a guy based in Leith. Um, he was a whiskey, whiskey blender and a whiskey pioneer who actually, does, um, who actually came up with a product of VAT 69 for anyone who is familiar with this. He basically wrote about the virtues of, of using the sherry casks. So it was definitely, um, sorry, 18, 1860, uh, the 1860s I, I was meaning. Um, so he was talking about using these type of casks back then. Um, and in the 1860s, um, we also had thing, uh, we also had grocers in Perth. These would have been um, sort of, uh, whiskey gro um, grocers and blenders and what they would do is they would buy the sherry casks in they would transport them to Perth uh, they would bottle the sherry um, on site so they'd sell on the sherry they'd still have the cask and then th what they'd be able to do is they'd either be able to sell on the whiskey cask to distilleries or use these um, casks themselves for their whiskey blending purposes. So again, this is sort of in the 18, 1860s, around that time. And obviously everything changed um, come 1987 when the Consejo Regulador stopped um, the bulk export of these casks, which meant that demand very, very uh, quickly outstripped the supply of these casks. At Aaron, we're very lucky to be able to have some of these traditional sherry casks still and also use some of them in some of our special edition products nowadays. But the majority of the ones we will use um, so with the majority of our uh, whiskey maturation are these pre-season casks. Uh, we get them from um, a, a number of sources. One is a guy called Miguel Martin, He's based um, in the south of Spain, and we also use cask earlier. But again, um, kind of going back to the importance of uh, wood policy, our um, uh, master distiller James would have actually gone over to Spain to see these uh, these places and check the quality of the casks just to make sure they were right for maturing our whiskies yes um they are oloroso casks so that was that's the with the um sherry that would have been used to season the casks usually um the casks are are seasoned the ones we use are seasoned with this type of of sherry and again we've kind of um made a little like nod to the sherry Hi there, Brian. Hello. Um, 
I just I just want to interrupt for one second. Yeah, no. Uh, comments that we've had about a few of the whiskies have been really good, um, especially uh, the, the the port one and this one, the sherry. Now, for those people who are um, going to place an order, remember we sent out 150 kits, so I'm hopefully speaking to 150 people at the moment. Um, very difficult to get the stock balance right of what people um, will expect to order or what we want to order. If there's any whiskies that you order um, online and it comes out that with none in stock, then just send us an email to say, look, really sorry, I've missed the boat. Um, I, would, I, would, I would like to order, a, when you get it back in, I would like to order a, a, a sherry um, cask. Then that allows me to order next month. So because we're doing eight whiskies, as I said, it's very difficult to get the balance right. And I've got a funny feeling that, um, but with the comments that we're having with this particular whiskey, we might end up out of stock uh, with people ordering tonight or tomorrow morning. So don't be disappointed if you order and it comes up zero out of stock. Send us another email to just say, let me know when it's back in stock, and you'll obviously get it at this um, special price. And that goes for all the whiskies that we're doing. Um, very difficult to get a balance right between eight whiskies, what's going to sell, what's not going to sell. Um, so bear with us. Um, if it's out of stock, let us know that you're interested. And when it comes back in, we'll let you know, definitely we'll let you know, um, and we'll do it. So sorry for interrupting you, Lucy, but I just don't want a mad panic on, on the waves. <laughs> we did a whiskey tasting at one point, and there was a limited edition whiskey, and they, they basically the website crashed. Um, so we didn't have to panic about anything. All whiskies will come back in stock at the agreed price. So, uh, so back to you, back to you, Lucy. Thanks, Brian. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I hope you're um, enjoying uh, this one here. It's certainly been popular since its launch. Um, but it's also a little comment as well about about the name. So Bodega is. Uh, the warehouses where they they keep um, these sherry casks and mature them. So you can see that on the right. Um, this is from Lustau, uh, which I actually visited last year. Um, and we've kind of uh, sort of taken that concept of the bodega where they hold these sherry casks and added them to our design, similar to what we've seen with the Bothy. And if I go back a stage on to the previous slide you can kind of just make it out there but when you when you buy the bottle you'll also notice it notice that kind of bodega um logo etched on again just a little nod to um where we get these absolutely fabulous uh casks from oh they indeed <laughs> um there we go so we go, that lovely image of the bodega there. And if I go on to the next slides, this is what, um, an example of uh, one of the casks that we'll, we'll import from um, these, <laughs> these uh, um, lovely sherry casks. This is from Cask Nolia, one of our um, lovely suppliers who we, I've, I gather, got um, some casks from recently. Um, and these, some of these lovely um, uh, casks that we, that add to the, the, the lovely flavors that we get um, from our sherry cask bodega. And these um, sherry casks will sort of make up around 20% of, of the casks that we buy in. Yes, of course, um, Ashley. So what happens is when you talk about seasoning a cask, I believe uh, casks are usually seasoned for about, um, for, for a couple of months, I believe. Um, and they're seasoned with these sherry wines um, for, for us to uh, just so they start to kind of import impart some of those lovely sherry flavors um 
on the casks. And I believe that's the case there. Um, and it's really handy that we're able to uh, select the type of uh, the actual wood as well, um, just to kind of give us that influence that we're looking for on our whiskies. So I hope there's Brian there. Yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, again, I have to say your name dropping when you come to casks. We talked about Amaroni, one yep. of the top Italian wines. So therefore, um, the casks are not cheap. Then you name drop Graham's, <laughs> one of the top, in fact, they're probably the top um, port producers there are with the Simonton or Simonton family that own wars as well. Um, uh, and then you name drop Lustau Sherry's as well. <laughs> one of the, the, the top sherry producers in Spain. So what people have to appreciate is that you're, you're dealing with the top wine producers, the sherry producers, the port producers, and therefore the casts are not going to be cheap. But that is definitely reflected in the quality of the finish of the spirit, mm -hmm. without, without a doubt. So um, you keep name dropping and I'll keep promoting <laughs> <laughs> Interestingly, <laughs> do, do not the thing. I'm trying to tell people who are not okay with um, wines, ports, and sherries just just how top of the range um, that you're doing. I mean, these these guys are Rolls Royces as far as <laughs> the, the the port industry is concerned, the sherry industry is concerned. Um, so you're you're talking with the top people who you know produce the top um, products, and you're buying the casks from them yeah definitely it's one to pick up on on your point there so we're very lucky uh, as they say to use these two types of sherry cask we don't actually use a sherry cask from Lustau, so i borrowed that that okay. photo to kind of give okay. you an idea of the um sort of like to, to give you an idea of like the image that we've used for the bodega however okay. we also uh, work with suppliers like bodega tradicion um, with some of our limited editions. So with our uh, Lacranza Castle um, Explorer series and also our Brodick Bay, which some of you might be familiar with. We've had, we've been lucky enough to work with those really lovely sherry producers to get those traditional style casks. Um, and if anyone's familiar with the, the James McTaggart's Man with a Golden Glass products, we used um, casks from a lovely, um, sherry cask bodega called Jimenez Spinola, um, which actually used the Pedro Jimenez grape, which is a different type of uh, grape than the one you'd use to make Oloroso. Um, Oloroso sherries and Fino sherries, but you use this PX grape, uh, they use this PX grape for making their sherry wines. So again, really special like family, um, family company and we get to, to work with these wonderful artisan producers who really kind of mirror the stuff we want to use um but again we also use the the finest quality from these uh pre-seasoned sherry casks as well but it's just interesting to see these different links and and how they they really um um kind of really bring out um not only our ethos but also bring to the table very nice quality casks for us to use Right, so I feel like people are moving on to the last whiskey of the evening, and this is our Macri Moor. So this time we're taking um, our spirit character and we're doing something slightly different. This time we are exploring Lacranza whiskey, but from a peated element. So Lacranza, um, our distillery at Lacranza and sort of Aaron's production from 1995. The main sort of idea behind it was producing an unpeated whiskey. Um, and this would have actually surprised people at the time. So Aaron is obviously on an island. As soon as we started producing in 1995, most people um, assumed we were going to start uh, producing peated whiskey and take the example of Isla. But again, kind of surprising people again, not only starting a new distillery from scratch in 1995, um, we decided to open with unpeated production and, un and creating an unpeated whiskey. 
Um, and this changed in, in 2004. So it was actually our Japanese distributor at the time, believe it or not, who had suggested uh, to the shareholders that we start playing with peat. And I know um, many people, many of the shareholders would have been reluctant at this time, but again, still being quite a new distillery. They were like, right, we're developing this, this sort of identity in the market. We're developing this new whiskey. We're going, we've opened with this unpeated whiskey. And obviously we're slightly nervous about a kind of straying from that, but uh, obviously um, they decided to proceed with it. And in 2004, we started experimenting with Pete. Um, and this was a project taken on by our first distillery manager, uh, Gordon Mitchell. I'll just stop myself there because I've seen um, a question here. The name Macri Moore. So again, uh, so what we've done with this product is we've linked it back to the island. So Macri Moore is actually a peat bog that we have on Arran. At the moment, we don't actually source our peat from Arran um, due to kind of uh, restrictions there with being able to sort of take out those uh, to remove peat from the grounds. But Macrimore is a peat bog on Arran and they've actually got standing stones very similar to Stonehenge, but obviously in much smaller scale. Um, and this is kind of the name we've taken for this peated whiskey. I see from Hazel saying, you don't usually like a peated whiskey, but you're pleasantly surprised by this. So this is a very lightly peated whiskey. It's 20 ppm, so very, very light, very delicate. And uh, Ewan Mitchell, our, our um, managing director, often uh, describes it as something that kind of is almost like a little gateway between unpeated, taking you to that sort of peated, uh, to kind of help you sort of explore that kind of peated element when it comes to whiskeys, because it is very, very, very delicate. Um, the Macrimore is 100% um, bourbon barrel matured whiskey. It's between six and, and seven years old. And again, that sort of that Aaron character with the bourbon kind of lifts that peat um, peat a bit. Ashley has mentioned yes, so we actually do use Highland peat. The peat that we use is from Tomental, so you're not going to get that sort of medicinal note that you would get from sort of using um, Isla peat. And with those Isla whiskies, it's a slightly different kind of uh, sort of burnt, almost like burnt wood is that kind of that kind of element that I get with that that peatiness. Um, with the Macrimore, it's it's 46%. We do also have another Macrimore that's at cask strength if you do like a uh, Macrimore that's a little bit stronger. But I think that sort of addition and, and reduction with water just really brings out that really fresh fruitiness mixed with that peat. But it's very light and very, very subtle. It is still in terms of the like the, the production process itself, the only parameter we've changed is we've experimented with that peated malt. So it is almost very like the barrel reserve, but with that kind of peaty twist at the end. Again, it's got that fresh fruitiness, a bit of tropical fruits kind of starting to tease in there. Um, but it's it's really interesting to see how that sort of PT element has combined with that iron character. Um, going back to sort of the initial stages of our, our peated production that we started to um, experiment with, this was um, basically a, a sort of project, a project that Gordon Mitchell, our first distillery manager, really um, started to develop. And so where Gordon Mitchell worked before joining Aaron was at Cooley's distillery in Ireland. And the last uh, product that he worked on there was a product called Connemara, which is a very lightly peated Irish whiskey um, that was um, 14 ppm. So actually the first initial um, whiskies, the peated whiskies that we would have produced at Iron would be 14 ppm. However, when James came to join us, that peating level raised a notch to 20 ppm. And funny enough, 20, 25 is, is a peating level you'll find at Bowmore, where James was working um, previously before joining Aaron. So again, it's interesting to, to see how our distillery manager's um, sort of experience with peat has kind of been brought to Aaron. Yes, that's, um, I've seen a, um, 
Ian points out with a macrame or a bottle. That is a, a dog on the design of the label. So with, um, again, the concept behind our Macrimor uh, products, this is kind of taking into account some of the folklore that we have on Aaron. So where Macrimor is that peat bog, where we have our lovely standing stones, um, there was a legend where a, a giant used to uh, chain his dog Bran to those rocks. And we've kind of incorporated that folklore onto the bottles of of Macri Moor, again, just to have a little nice tie to the island. So with James, he sort of brought in that 20 ppm malt production. So again, we have our um, barley um, malted when it comes to us. Um, and what they'll do at the maltsters is they usually have 50 ppm barley um, and they'll add some zero ppm barley um, to make sure it's sort of reduced down to the specification we want at that 20 pm that really really lightly uh, peated um, peated barley that we use in in 2011 we moved up a notch again within our own uh, production at La Cranza. we started experimenting with some 50 ppm malts um, just again to see see what the kind of effect that would have and, and just to kind of experiment a little bit. Um, I see Bob's mentioned that he prefers non-peated. It's, it's definitely a, a term of preference. And I think um, it's really, you do get very, very different flavors there. Um, but I think the Macrimor really nicely kind of gently introduces you to that, that peaty side of things. Um, so yeah, in 2011, we were experimenting with 50 ppm malts, um, and we've taken that to the next level, as you will have seen in your your video um, during the halftime break. But also at the beginning, I'd mentioned our next adventure, which is Lag. So this is our new distillery that we opened up last year, and this is a distillery that's completely dedicated to the production of um peated whiskey so all the whiskey that we're going to produce at lag is 50 ppm and heavily peated uh, a next adventure for us and also kind of showing a slightly different um style with aaron whiskey that can be produced over on the south side of the island the visitor center opened in june last year um so we've only and not too long ago have celebrated our first birthday a very exciting chapter for us ah good question from drams dra uh, from dram Plusters. so we've actually have stopped peated production at la Cranza, but we do have plenty of stocks left in order to keep providing the macri more that sort of peated side of the production has very much moved to lag however it will be a very different style whiskey, not only with the sort of style of the spirit, slightly a bit more oily, a bit heavier as well. The the stills are a very different shape, um, but also it'll be sort of concentrating on that 50 ppm side of things. However, a, an interesting point to note is the Macri Moore brand will stay with La Cranza because that's the kind of style, the sort of like core style of that whiskey has been produced at La Cranza. So if we move that to lag, it would be a, a very different style whiskey. Um, another story that I think it's quite funny as well when it comes to uh, looking at sort of how the second distillery came about. Uh, believe it or not, we were initially looking for more warehousing, um, which is why we sort of started exploring lands in the south sides of the island. Um, and when we found this, this land for warehousing, we thought, well, we can't just have warehousing altogether. And it was James and, and Ewan's idea to maybe sort of starts up a small craft distillery down the south side of the island to go with uh, the warehousing. However, our main shareholder decided if we're going to be building a distillery, we're going to go big. And with that, the idea of lag distillery came about and that's what we have. Um, so it's a really, it's a nice way to kind of explore both sides of the island and also two different styles from kind of the same 
well, the same place, the same island. So again, definitely one to come and visit when you guys are able to come over and see us on Aaron. Um, there we go. A lovely Aran coastal view. Is that which one is that, Bob? There we go. Oh, the, the coastal view is that from the first, first or second slide? The coastal view. Uh, um, <laughs> Well, thank you very much, uh, Lucy. No worries at all. Um, that was a, a great, <laughs> as you can see by the comments, a great range of um, whiskies. I have to repeat myself because the orders are coming in thick and fast at the moment. Um, if we're out of stock of anything, it's just because we do have no idea what we're going to sell. Don't be disappointed. Um, just send us a separate email to say I placed an order for X, Y, Z. Um, it was out of stock. Please let me know when it comes in, and um, we'll let you know um, when it comes in. Uh, I think James McTaggart is an icon within. I'm sure you'll agree within the, the, the whiskey industry. He, he he definitely is, but been very privileged. And so has Karen over the years to be in his company at private tastings or whatever. Mm -hmm. And especially when we brought the dram busters over, like a 54 seater bus would leave, okay. we, 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 we would land on foot. Aaron would, would um, hire stagecoach to get a 54 seater bus to put us all on. We'd arrive. And we'd wander about, um, and again, Aaron would do two special tastings for us, split us into two groups. And I was wandering about, and there was James just wandering about. Oh, hello, Brian, how's it going? And he was like, your best mate. And he was like, yeah. nothing was a bother to him. He was just, and like James. he's so softly spoken, he's so calm. He's like, your best mate you've ever had. And he's, he's just... <laughs> <coughs> incredibly <coughs> talented, but yet just blends in with <coughs> with everybody. That sounds like James, yeah, yeah. He, he is an icon within the whiskey industry. So, um, sorry, oh, there's a few questions coming up. From David yeah. so five years old. Um, so yeah, this is only the first edition we've released, and it is going to be part of our, our core range, but a very limited part. So that we will also have um, a release next year. Um, but obviously, just given sort of the the rarity of the stock, it will be a, a very limited release. You are most welcome. Thank you very much for for joining us. It's been so much fun going through the Iron Range. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as, as I have. Oh, I'm starting to, I'm starting to well up. Wait a minute. We haven't done, we haven't done the raffle yet. Oh, well, it's not over. It's Hi. definitely not over. Uh, so, uh, Lucy, we'll give you um, 10 minutes on your own as such. Um, Karen and I will do the raffle, so we'll take you off the screen. And um, it's up, if, if you want to stay live as such, after the tasting, we can get back together and just discuss, wonderful. discuss um, how great we are. <laughs> and good luck to everyone for the raffle. You've got some yeah. fantastic prizes. Yeah, well, I, 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 well, I mean, you can actually, Ken, although you're going off screen, you can uh, stay and see what the prizes are. But oh, anyway, well. okay. Uh, thank you for your time anyway. And Karen no and We'll speak to you later, and I'm sure there will be a Dram Busters visit to Aaron. Oh, once everything, that one, ever, uh, tell Aaron that we're coming. I will do, brace ourselves. Oh, oh, but, <laughs> but, we're coming back, but I'm doing the hatches. Tell you and brace themselves. <laughs> uh, thank you for your time, Lucy. And, uh, thank you guys very much. Uh, see you shortly, okay? Brilliant. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Right, folks, raffle time. Ta -da, ta -da, ta -da, ta -da. We hope you've enjoyed your, 
evening. It's been really great. I know that everybody was so excited about this, and we sold out all the kits, which is a, a really good uh, testament to Aaron for their whiskies and what and what they're doing. Um, so we have um, we had eight prizes. We now have seven because the coat roti from the uh, coat de Rhone, the limited edition, has been gone. So what we're going to do is um, we have. We have, and um, we haven't tried this one tonight, but we'll show you what we have. The first two names out the hat. Look at this beauty. 18 year old Aaron. Now, look at that. 82 pound 50 a bottle. Look at that. Look at that. That was going to be a prize. It's no now. Can't afford it. Nah, I'm okay. First two names out the hat, okay, we'll get a bottle of this. So, here we go. Again, Cam did the first one, I will do this one. So, three, one, one. Right, okay, three, one, one. Let me get my facts right. Oh, P Styles. Ticket number 311 P Styles. Well done, fam. Next one out the hat, Karen will do. Again, this is for an 18 year old. Two, four, zero. And two four zero is the psych. Well done. Now, ladies and gentlemen, another limited edition. And um, we talked about the twelve-year-old one that uh, was just released from Aaron, the one that's been aged for twelve years in an Italian cask. That was their second release. This is their first release, Indie Brands Private Cask. We have three bottles left, £70 a bottle. So the next three people are getting this limited edition Aaron Whiskey. And there was only 240 bottles produced. So here we go. Three zero six. Three zero six. Ha! Hey, that's just the way it goes. Palm Styles again. Right, Cam can do this one. And he's, uh, as you can see, we're shuffling them. Nope. Ooh. One nine nine. Well done, Connor. One Connor McMahon. Nine, nine. Connor McMahon, yep. Right. Three zero nine. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah, that's Palm Styles. But they're all shuffled. It has to be said, though, the Palm Styles has bought a lot of tickets, so uh, it's oh, just the way it goes. Just it. Yep. Two, one, nine. Duncan McQueen. I've got them here. Okay, that's for that one as well. Yep. 
So well done, Duncan. And uh, now we go on to the last two. This is uh, a whiskey that we hadn't tried. This is the Saturn's finish. Okay. Uh, so the next two people will get this one. Three, 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 Willie Welsh. Willie Welsh, well done, Willie Welsh. All the threes. And the last one. Four, eight, one. And four, eight, one is G. McDonald. Well done, Gordon. Congratulations. Four, eight, one. Now, we've actually raised a bit more money than uh, we thought because there's been a couple of people been buying um, raffle tickets online during it. So we do have another prize, and that will be the barrel reserve, okay? This is just an add-on. So the barrel reserve, because we've got more money coming in. I'll just do this. Four to six and four to six is P. Brimby. Well done, Paul. Just as an extra one, because the money coming in is the money that we. We pay out so. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for your participation. Uh, thank you very much for your comments and encouragement. <coughs> it's been really good. Um, it's been just a bad year for everybody. We're doing our best. You guys are <laughs> very, very well supporting us. We can't thank you enough. It's hard work on our behalf, but everybody's getting the benefit from it. Um, and we're getting all the people to support us um, from the whiskey industry as well. We're all finding it quite hard. Um, and it's great to be on a Friday night where you can enjoy yourself, relax, have eight nice whiskies, learn about the whiskies, have a bit of fun with the raffle, um, and just have a, a, a good time. So thank you very much yet again for your support. Uh, next week, we've got nothing. <laughs> Following week, we've got a gin tasting. If you haven't bought your gin kits or if you know somebody who's interested in a gin tasting, um, let them know. Contact us, order their kits. And lastly, on the 11th of December, we've got um, the Tom and Tom Glen Caram tasting. Um, we've already sold about three, 400 quid's worth of raffle tickets for that. There's still kits available. Um, I don't think people appreciate the fact, as I said, that we were making the kits up in advance so that when you were ordering your kits for whatever tastings, you were, we were trying to deliver them or collect them at the same time. Um, so we're doing our best. Um, there will be a letter coming out to everybody, an email letter coming out at the beginning of the month about a, a special um, tasting that we're doing. It's limited to 10 people. Oops. Um, so we can wait for that one. And then we'll go back on track in January and in February. And we'll start doing our rum tastings, gin tastings, and whiskey tastings again. But in January, I think we're Karen and I are going to put our feet up for two or three weeks, take a big deep breath, and catch up with what we're doing. Um, I've probably done about 10,000 of these bottles since lockdown. Um, but it's been good fun. It's been good fun. Your comments have been very encouraging. Um, thank you.
thank you for your support. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed your evening. I hope that you will support us and Aaron for what we're doing. You have done previously. There's no reason why not with eight really good whiskies. Um, and thank you for your support. And I hope it continues. We're a wee private business. We rely on word of mouth. We, we, we do well. We think we do a good delivery service. It's free within 20 miles. We try and do it within a couple of days. Some people get it within a couple of hours. It's just your Donald Duck, um, depending on the weather. I don't know why I get my hair wet and I'm out in the van, you know. Um, but thank you for your support. Um, have a good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And thank, on behalf of all the drum busters here, and there's 150, Lucy, I will say in front of everybody, thank you for your time, your information, your presentation. It was fantastic. And I hope that reflects in the order. So, ladies and gentlemen, enjoy your evening. Finish off your evening with a beer, a wine, whatever you want. Thank you very much on behalf of Carl and I and the staff of TB Watson's for your support. Thank you very much. <laughs>